Amen. Amen. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? That is the title of the message this morning. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18, we're going to be speaking, uh, reading and speaking through this text here. And uh, for some of you that do know or do not know, Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And um, it's... Uh, the, the Lord brought this message to me here a couple of days ago. Actually, he's been speaking to me about this all week. And um, I've, I've read this story a million times, been through this a million times, and the Lord allowed me to see something very different. I believe that what the world is going through today, the church also is going through as well. You know what I'm saying? The church also is going through it as well. And so we're facing such an evil that is very bold. I was watching a, a, a prayer service on Tuesday, and it was part of a prayer service on Tuesday, and the pastor at the very end said, pray for a police officers to go to the police officers and thank them and to tell them you're praying for them. Now, this pastor was from Times Square Church in New York City. And little did he know, and it's not coincidence, that just several days later, a young man would take his life, but before taking his life, he would take the life of two New York City police officers as they sat in their cruiser. Now, only the Holy Spirit can move on, on the hearts of his people. And he may not tell us exactly what's going to happen, but he can allow us to understand what may transpire, not in detail, but in the way Satan is planning to attack not just the church of Christ, but to attack this world. And so, that's not coincidence. It's not coincidence that in New York City, a pastor would say on a Tuesday, go up to a police officer and tell them you're praying for them and thank them for, their, for what they're doing. Amen. That's not coincidence. This morning, the Lord has a question to give to us. What are you doing here? Now, not really just what are you doing here in this church. What are you doing here on this earth? What are you doing here in the, freedom, the state of mind that you're in right now? And seriously, guys, get serious today with Jesus. Let, let us really get serious with Christ. Right now, I want us to all just pause right now in our life where we're at. Right, just stop. And what is inside of us right now? Anger, confusion, depression, joy, hostility, greed, corruption, planning and scheming? Or, or, or are you thankful? Are you, are you honoring God? Where are we right now? Because our life could end right now. Right now. Jesus could come. Right now, you can drop dead of a heart attack. Right now, your heart could just say, I'm done. And that's it. What are you doing here? The prophet Elijah had just accomplished a major battle for God. Old Testament times are very brutal. You know, they, they would stone you in public. They would cut your head off in public. <laughs> the Old Testament times were very brutal. As a matter of fact, where this world is returning to those types of times. Elijah was given a, a, a command and a call by God to, to, to face the false prophets of the day and to expose them and to cut them down. And that is exactly what Elijah did. 
in chapter 18. But in chapter 19, after he cut down all the false prophets, the king's wife, Jezebel, had heard. She was very angry because those were her prophets. Those were her religious people. Those were her go-to people. And so in chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Now King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She says, I make a, a, a promise, a vow, an oath to myself that if Elijah is not dead, like he killed those prophets of mine today, so may the gods deal with me. As far as she was concerned, within all her reasoning and understanding and power, she was going to end the life of a man of God. Now church, we're not at battle with flesh and blood. But there are people in this world who have succumbed to the powers of Satan. And yes, they're here in the United States of America. You never know when you're going to walk into your job and someone with this type of a mind frame has come to take you out. We're not at battle with flesh and blood. We're not called to arm ourselves and carry guns, though in the state of Texas, I hear they're going to be passing a law where we have an open, concealed gun. That's not what I'm talking about here, being prepared to face this type of evil that has come. Where, what are you doing here? If I die, I die. If I live, I live. As people of God on this earth, we're not going to have no fear. You know, the presence of fear in the life of the Christians is the absence of faith. When you are fearing things, when, you're, when you have fear operating, there is no faith in Christ anymore in you. Because fear steals that. Faith dissolves fear. And in verse 3, it says that, And Elijah was afraid. He lost faith. Verse 3 says, And he was afraid, and rose, and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. You see, a lot of Christians today are running for their lives. It's a great thing. We had a baby dedication here. But, you know, as a pastor, I'm seeing more and more believers and confessors of Christ running for their lives because the enemy is on their heels. They're running for their lives. They're doing what, you know, they're not following the plan of God. They're not seeking the will of God. And they're doing what their heart is leading them to desire to do. And you see, a lot of people say, trust in the heart. Follow your heart. It grieves me when I hear a Christian say that. Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful, is deceit, deceitful, easily deceived. The heart is wicked. And then that just tells me how that Christian does not know what the Word of God teaches. Follow your heart. No, the Word of God says don't follow your heart. Follow the Word of God. Amen. You see, Elijah heard the voice of the enemy. It was a, it was a demonic voice spoken through a woman. And Elijah heard death was coming to him, and he was afraid. He had just accomplished a great victory. The whole nation of Israel saw that Elijah was a man of God, that he had power and authority from God above. But yet when this woman said, I'm going to kill you, it went right out the window. And that's why, church, you can't live on yesterday's victories. You cannot say, oh, I used to serve in the church back in 1985 or something like that. That was yesterday. What I preached last Sunday was last Sunday. What I'm living today, what I'm speaking today, that's today. Tomorrow may not even come for you or me. But yet we have faith that it'll come. The Bible says we're not guaranteed tomorrow. If your life was to end today, and don't say, well, you know, that's a far stretch. 180,000 people die every day in this world. That may be you one day. Elijah thought that was him. 
Elijah started to run, and he left his servant. You know, as people of God, we're leaving our children behind. We're getting consumed by our careers and dreams that we think we may have for us or our family or whatever it is. And we're, we're leaving what is really important. Elijah left his servant. His servant was there. God gave him a servant to entrust to Elijah. The, the Elijah could care and, and the, the servant could care for Elijah. But Elijah let it all go. He let it all go. He ran for his life. He thought only of himself. Verse 4, and he went himself a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down there under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life for I'm not better than my father's. You see, when we run from God, we we run into the wilderness, so to speak. If you're going to go into the wilderness, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted and he fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights. But yet he was led by the Holy Spirit. But Elijah was not. And Elijah ran into the wilderness in his own understanding, in his own power. Is anybody in the wilderness today? Because they're running away from the Lord. Because you went through something so hard in your life that you feel God failed you. That's a lie. God didn't fail you. God never fails. I'm not here just saying neat cliches or trying to fill church pews. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise, eat. And then he looked, and behold, there was at his head bread and a cake. A bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate a second time and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, something interesting here. If you ever find yourself down and out, Christian, speak to the Christian. You know, you, you have to, it's a process to getting up sometimes. I mean, sometimes you just exercise the faith and you just jump right into it and you say, praise God. You don't care what the devil has thrown at you. You know, and we had to bury our daughter. And that's a hard thing to do. But the Lord stood right there with me and my wife. And we were able to do the hardest thing in our life up until that point because the Lord was there. He was feeding us. He was giving us drink. He was speaking to us. He was leading us. But you see, Elijah was so deep in, the, in darkness. He was so deep in depression that his physical body was just gone. And he said, eat. Drink. Two times an angel had to come and tell him, eat, drink. You know, when, when you're going through hard things, church, sometimes you got to get up and you got to make yourself physically, spiritually eat, drink. Get into the word. Read a little bit of Psalms. Read a little bit of the Proverbs. The Psalms and the Proverbs are some of the greatest books to read when you're going through really dark times in your life. It gives you wisdom. It gives you encouragement. Gives you instruction to be warned to not continue in the path that you're going if you're in darkness. And so this angel was speaking to him. Get up and go. Go to the mountain of God. See, as a believer, you're not called to stay in darkness. You're not called, you're you're called to go to the mountain of God. Who wants to go to the mountain of God today? Who wants to go to the mountain? Who's been to the mountain of God? You know, when Moses went to the mountain, he got the Ten Commandments. He heard the voice of God. He saw God. He fellowshiped with God. He was at the mountain of God. And I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not just talking physically. I'm talking spiritually. You want to go to that, that high place with God. You want to go to where only he could take you and speak to you. And there is no, nothing, nothing in this world can distract you at that time. You're at a place where you're totally, you're totally in the presence of God. The one who created you, who breathed life into you. 
And some of us have forgotten what that means to be in the presence of God. Because we've been desensitized by the things of the world. We, we're, we're at our jobs, in our schools. We're around people who don't know the Lord and, and what they, they're doing and what they're involved in. And it comes to you, Christian. And it, it begins to desensitize you. And you forget the ways of God. And you forget the call of God. And you forget the voice of God. And you forget when, why you were born on this, and to live on this earth. You know what a beautiful thing it is? When you begin to do what you know God put you on this earth to do. And that was to glorify his name. Amen. So in verse 9, he says, He came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the, God, uh, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, Elijah had ran for 40 days and 40 nights. In the process of that, you would have thought that a mighty man of God finally got it, finally understood it. But he was, he was still in darkness. His mind was still not right. His heart was still in a bad place. He was still hearing the voice of Jezebel. I'm going to kill you. And that's what a lot of Christians today are hearing. The voice of, of a spiritual Jezebel. You're dead. You can't pray in the name of Jesus. You can't stand up in public. That's polit politically incorrect. When Jesus says, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father and his angels who are in heaven. I'm not saying you got to be a, a super freak. you got to go and quote scripture. But if I was to go to your job, or any one of us brothers and sisters in Christ was to go to your job, and I'm speaking to those watching, on the internet and say, oh yeah, so-and-so goes to our church. He, you know, he's a Christian. And if they were to be shocked, he's a Christian? She's a Christian? You know, we, you're in a cave. But see, not only that, we, today we live in a generation where people confess the name of Christ and they live in immorality. They live in, they, they live in, being deceived by the enemy. They're doing things that the word of God said don't do. Why? Not because God wants to be mean to us. Because God wants to protect us. You know, as a child wants to stick their finger in a light socket, we say, no, don't do that. That child, all they hear is, why are you telling me to do what to do all the time? When the parent is telling them no because we want to protect them. And that's God. That's God in his word with us. God says don't do these things because he knows they bring destruction in our life. What are we doing here? Verse 10. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They torn down your altars and they killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. See, he said, Jezebel wants to kill me. I'm the only prophet left. You know, everyone in Israel has forgotten you and abandoned you. He don't even realize that he's abandoned God too. You see, we as Christians, we can identify what society is doing against God and his kingdom today. Amen? Amen? But are we abandoning God too? Are you abandoning God? Am I abandoning God? See, he had this self-righteous thing. He had this me, 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 I, I, I speech coming from his heart. I have been very zealous for you, Lord. Meaning, I... I I was there for you. I was the only one who spoke for you, God. And they're, they're coming to kill me now. And I'm the only one left. So verse 11. So he said, God says to him, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. He says, I want to show you something, Elijah. You see, when you're in that dark place, when you're in that cave, God's going to reveal some things to you if you're willing to step out by faith. Come on, Elijah. Come on out. S stand on the edge. Come out of darkness and just stand. Just stand right there. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that he is God. Amen. Just come out and stand still. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking it into pieces. And the rocks were breaking before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. He was not in the wind. 
After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after a fire, a sound of a gentle blowing wind. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Two times the Lord had asked him, what are you doing here? What, what are you doing here? You know, on 9-11, the Lord spoke to me for the first time since 1988. In a long time. And I remember when those towers fell. That the Lord, I heard the voice of the Lord. And I told my friends at work, I said, you know, somewhere in the Bible, it, it talked about these times were going to happen. And they said, man, what do you know about the Bible? You don't know nothing. And I put my head down. I'm like, you're right. I don't know nothing. What am I talking about? I'm stupid. And so I just went about my business. And two years later, the Lord spoke to me again. What are you doing? And I wasn't going to miss it this time. And we can't miss the voice of the Lord. Samuel, a little baby boy, was dedicated to, to the Lord like we dedicated a child here. His mother was at the altar. She, had, she was barren. She had no children. And she said, Lord, if you will give me a son, if you will give me a son, I, I will bring him to the, when he's old enough, I'll bring him to the temple. I'll dedicate him to you. And he'll serve in your house. He'll be a priest. He'll, he'll honor you. He'll, he'll do what you would call him to do. You see, she was asking for something, but not for herself. She was wanting, she, you know, she could have said, well, if, uh, if it's God's will, I'll have a baby. Or if it's not his will, then I'll be satisfied. No. She just knew deep down inside. And so she began to pray. And she began to seek and to push the doors down. And God gave her a child. And to her, true to her word, she came back when he was young enough to be on his own. And she dedicated him. And as a young boy, the Bible says that the young Samuel, he would sleep at the temple door of the Lord. He slept, at the, he slept on the floor by the door of the Lord, the, to the temple. He wanted to be to the closest place to the Holy of Holies, to the, in, to, to the presence of where God was in that temple. And the Lord came and spoke to him, Samuel. He got up and he went to the priest. You call me, you know, you know, priest or whoever, Lord, servant, or whatever, brother, you know. <laughs> Did you call me? No, go to bed. Samuel, going back to Eli the priest. Did you call me? No. Samuel, what? Eli finally told him, when next time you hear that voice, tell him, I'm listening, Lord. Your servant is listening. So to speak, that's what he said. The Lord wants to speak to you. The Lord loves you. The Lord, he truly has plans for you. You know, you hear that all the time. God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose. He really does. He really, really does. You know, you, you look at the way the world works. You know, the stars and the sun and the moon. It's so consistent. It's so repetitious, you know. And we take that for granted. The sun coming up every morning and setting and the moon coming and then leaving. We take those things for granted. But God is so faithful. He sets something into motion and only he can stop it. Amen. And if God can do such incredible things like that, if, if he can allow us to through the Hubble telescope to see millions of light years away, how much more is the deeper and good is the plan of God for, for our lives, for his church on the earth? We limit God. I really do. I believe Elijah limited God. You know, he, he lost faith. You know, he caught fire down from heaven. He caught fire down from heaven. But yet when he heard a demonic voice through Jezebel saying, You're dead meat. It all went out the window. You can't live in yesterday's victories, church. You cannot live in yesterday's victories. You cannot say, oh, I've been a Christian since this year or that year. No, today is the day of salvation. What is happening today in your life? What is God doing in your life today? What is Satan doing in your life today? The Bible says that when it's all said and done, God's people will be in heaven 
and that there, he will have to wipe away every tear. God will wipe away every tear. Why is that? Do you ever think about that? There's going to be people in heaven that Jesus said they're going to get in through the skin of their teeth. Jesus said that the road to hell is wide and many will find it. Jesus said that the road to heaven is narrow and only a few will find it. Jesus said there will be some who stand on my left and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Jesus said that there will be some on his right who will say, you know, we, we honored you, God. And God said, come, come into my, my peace. Come into, come into me. I have a place prepared for you. You know, there are people that think they're on their way to heaven and there are people that are on their way to heaven. Where are we? What are we doing? Are we a deceived generation? One thing I know, the Bible, the Apostle Paul, Peter, Jude, a lot of them talked about our day today. Daniel talked about our day. John, they talked about our day today. The end of the church age. The end of the world is not coming. If you understand what the Bible teaches, we're coming to the end of a church age. The church began when Jesus was raised from the dead. And it's coming to an end, the age of the church. And we're getting ready to enter into a seven-year tribulation. Followed by a thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. But Jesus, and the Bible says that that seven-year age will be so terrible that if God doesn't cut that time short, no one on the earth would survive. You have no idea, church, what the world is headed to. Some will escape it, and some will go through it. Yes, I believe in the rapture of the church, but I don't know when that's going to happen, and neither do you. If the Lord tarries and says, well, you know what? Stick on the earth for a couple more years and go through some, some of these tribulation ages. Would, you, would your faith in Christ save you and your family? Man, you young people, you are exposed to so much than any other generation ever. So much. You know, you, you have technology is, in, is mind-boggling, incredible. I can, I can, I can Skype face-to-face -face with, with my pastor friend from India. You know, I, 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 we can do these things now. What happens in the streets of Jerusalem, we can see instantly now. Instantly. Incredible things. I mean, technology is, is incredible. But yet, Satan has found a foothold to really take this generation through those things. And people are becoming more and more deceived. And God tells, tells Elijah, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the, the earthquake. I'm not in the fire. I'm not in, in, the, in the, the strong wind. But he was in the gentleness he comes to you as a gentleman. I've told y'all that time and time before. God is a gentleman. God does not force himself on nobody. I spent a lot of years not understanding that. A lot of years. I finally come to understand, Michael said to the Lord, you don't have to convince nobody. You just tell them what I've done for you. You just tell them what I put on your heart. You know, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. My children, they're not really children no more. I'm going on 20, 21 years old. They're accountable. They're not going to get into heaven because their daddy's a pastor. Though we've done the best we can, we're not perfect, but they have their own battles that they're getting ready to face. Their own trials, their own tribulations. They're going to taste the devil. They're going to taste the goodness of God. And parents, you need to understand something. You, you, some of you parents have no idea what your kids are facing. That's why here are high school and college ages together, because they're facing the same types of situations. And while a lot of churches and pastors in the pulpits in America, they're playing with the Word of God. They're, 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 they're you know, watering down the message so that they can keep seats, people in the seats. Guys, that's dangerous. We, we can never alter the Word of God. And we must, through the power of the Holy Spirit, present it in the way God wants it to be presented to the world. What are you doing here, Elijah? 
Elijah, you heard that demonic voice, but I come to you in a gentle, still, small voice. Elijah, what are you doing? Why are you making this mistake of running? Elijah, I never knew you to run from a battle before, Elijah. Why are you running away from me? Elijah, why are you listening? Elijah, didn't I show you my power, my glory? Elijah, didn't I call you before you were created in the womb of your mother? Elijah, don't you remember these things, Elijah? Why are you hiding in this cave in depression in fear and in darkness? Why, Elijah? Why? For me? I looked at myself in the mirror, June 8th, 2003, drunk, 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 7 in the morning, Sunday, and I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. Lord, I'm going to do whatever you want to do from here on out. I'll be a holy roller. I'll be a Jesus freak. I don't care. I just need you to save me because I'm, I'm about to die. I'm about to lose my marriage. I'm probably going to go to jail because I'm really thinking some bad things in my head. I need to be saved, Jesus. And that was the beginning. When you really get serious, and you know what? You have to stay there. Yes. Amen. You have to stay in that state of mind of, I need you, Jesus. Because if you start growing up as a Christian and then you start forgetting where the Lord met you, you're in trouble. You'll go back into that cave like Elijah, mighty prophet of God, but yet he became, there had to have been a certain measure of pride. I don't know. Because apparently he thought he was the only prophet left. <laughs> Are you really going to think, Elijah, that God is that small? That God, could, that God couldn't see the beginning and the end of this situation you're in, Elijah? That's got to speak to us today. Verse 14, then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. He says it a second time, word for word. I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They torn down your altars. They killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He says it a second time, like God didn't hear it the first time. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, go. You know, the Lord didn't say, oh, Elijah, man, you're right. What am I going to do? Man, whoa, you got me on this one, Elijah. I'm the, heaven, I'm the king of heaven and earth, but oh, man, I'm pacing the floors now, Elijah. I don't know what to do. Did God say that? No. God didn't even address the situation. God didn't even address that. At first. What did God say? He said, the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint two kings and a prophet to take your place. Well, what did he say? The way you just came... Go back. You see, when you, Christian, run from a spiritual battle, God, even if it takes a year or two years, God will bring it back to you again to make you face it again. See, some of you are not hearing. God has marked the path for your Christian walk. And at this point, at this point, at this point, at this point, there are some spiritual uh, battles, there are some demonic forces that you're going to encounter at certain places, at certain milestones. And if you don't conquer them, you take a step back, and you want, it may be years, it may be months, but when you feel you're getting strong again in the Lord, you've got to face that same demon and conquer it to move to the next step. And for us, what is that? Lust, greed. You know, we can go on and on. Drunkenness, perversion. I mean, on and on. on man, there's so much out there that, that Satan has created such evil to trip up humanity. To become a, an obstacle from getting to Jesus. From finding what Jesus has for you. For me, it was drunkenness. For you, what is it? For me today, there's other obstacles that are in me, before me. But I'm not running from them, and I can't run from them, because if I do run from them, guess what? I fail not only God, but I fail you. We fail each other. 
Because our Christian life is not about me, or your Christian life is not about you, but it's about others. Elijah, go back. Remember who you are. You're a prophet. I put my spirit upon you. Now you go back the way you came here with your tail between your legs. Go back the same way. 40 days, 40 nights. Go back and you got work to do. Anoint two kings and another prophet to take your place. You're getting to come with me, buddy. Verse 17. It shall come upon that the one who escapes from the sword of, of these two kings, they shall put the ones to death. And you know, what is he saying? He's saying that these two kings are going to be doing some work. They're going to be putting some things down that were trying to poke a finger in the eye of God. And God is saying, I'm going to take care of these things. Verse 18, but I love this part right here. He says, but yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. He says, Elijah, by the way, he says at the very end, by the way, Elijah, you're not the only one. There's 7,000 others just like you. So, Elijah, if you don't do this, I got 7,000 others that will do it. If you don't do what God has put you on this earth to do, he's got others that will do it, what you were called to do. See, God built this building 40 plus years ago. The church built it, and they closed down, they left. But God said, I'll bring another church. I'll bring another pastors into this place. And if we're not faithful, God will remove us, and he'll bring another church in. You see what I'm saying? And it's in your personal lives as well. All Christians, not just pastors, all Christians, if you run from your spiritual battles, if you run from the things that God has placed before you to fight and to fight the good fight and be victorious over, and if you don't face those things and you run from them, God will bring somebody else to tear that wall down. But Elijah heard, because you know why? There's nothing like hearing the voice of the Lord. You know how you hear the voice? You know how Elijah got that instruction? He had to go so deep and so low in his own pity that God said, I have grace and mercy for you. I'm going to speak to you. And he spoke to him. When you're really down, you pray. Am I right? When you're going through the hardest times in your life, you pray. Am I right? When somebody's very close to you is sick in the hospital and dying, you pray, right? When you're sick and you're dying, you pray, right? Yeah. Whatever, come on. Yeah. But what about the good times? When everything's good, a season, you're in a season of goodness. And you stop praying. You see, the lesson is that if we always, always have a desire and a hunger to want to hear the voice of the Lord, in good times and in bad times, yeah. you're always going to be in the right place. You're never going to be in that cave. You're never going to be where Satan wants you to be. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 12 says this. Peter talks in regards to the nation of God's people worldwide, the Christian church. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, he called Elijah out of darkness and into the marvelous light. He's called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Are you listening, church? What, what, what were you doing here? What are you doing here if you're in darkness, said God? What are you doing in darkness? There's no life in darkness. Nothing grows in the darkness. There's deceit in the darkness. But he called you out into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people. Amen? Once we were not a people. But now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, says Peter, I urge you as aliens and strangers of this world to abstain from fleshly lusts, meaning all sins, that desires of the heart, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, among unbelievers, so that in the thing in which you, they slander you as evildoers, they may be because of your good deeds, as they observe them, they'll glorify God in the day God visits us. You see, they may make fun of you because you follow Christ, because you pray, because you go to church, because you do what the Bible says. 
And they may laugh. They may make fun of you. They may mock you. They may take your words and twist them around. They do that to the word of God. They'll do that to your word, Christian. Jesus said they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. But in the day that Christ visits, they're going to glorify what you did in the name of Jesus. We have to obey the call of the light to come out of darkness. The prophet Elijah was in the cave. He was depressed. He was running from Jezebel. Many have been called by God, but like Elijah, they are depressed. They're repressed. They're overwhelmed by the enemies of the Lord. Folks, folks, we must come out of the cave. We must come out of the cave. We must understand what desires us to run into the cave in the first place. What makes you run into the cave in the first place? What makes you run away from God? You need to be mindful of those things. You need to recognize those things. And you need to put an end to those things. Amen? Amen. Man, when you find yourself not praying anymore, not being in the Word of God, what was it that got you there? Stop it. Put it into it. When I wake up in the morning, what is the first thing? I want to seek the Lord. Yes, I got to brush my teeth. I got to take a shower. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. But I need to seek the Lord first. And throughout the day, you need to seek him. And at night, when you lay down, you need to thank him. When we went to New York City, right there by the Brooklyn Bridge, there was these Muslim men that were selling hot dogs and all that in those stands. And uh, Anna wanted to eat there, but I kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to eat there. <laughs> Not because they're Muslim, but because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a how do you call it, germ freak. I'm very, I'm very... I'm weird. Yes, I am. I'm very germs. I'm, I'm germ phobic, whatever. And I just thought, no, I don't know. That. Even though they got the sticker there, permit says New York City, but that's New York City, you know. So I don't know. I don't want to eat there. And so I saw a man who was working with them. He put a placemat on the ground and he began to bow down. Thousands of people right there on the street. I'm thousands. And he's just bowing to, I, I guess, in a certain direction. You could tell he was bowing down. He was just going like that up and down. And he, had, he was Muslim. And people were walking by. He didn't care. He wasn't ashamed. You know, when I go to, when I go to uh, eat with my family, we pray over our food. Bless you. But there are some Christians who are just politically incorrect, but thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know? But yet, you know, we got to be bold for Christ. Yeah. We have to be bold for Christ. You see, Elijah had an issue with the false prophets who were leading the Lord's people astray. Sin, false worship of false gods was widespread. It was throughout the land. Church, sin cannot entertain us any longer. Those bad movies, that bad music, those people who just tell those dirty jokes in restaurants, in at work, you cannot be entertained by that anymore. Amen. What does that do to the heart of God when he calls you his child and yet you, his child, are being entertained by the camp of the enemy? We as a people of God must be aware of the destruction and the consequences that sin when it takes root. And it takes root in our minds and hearts what it does. If God had allowed it, Elijah would have ran so far from God, we would have never heard from him again in the Bible. God does not need us, but God is calling us into his light. We are being called to come out of the cave, to come out of spiritual darkness, to come out of demonic influences and practices that penetrate our lives and family on a daily basis. Folks, we are being called to go to the place of victory. Some of you believe you have no right to serve the Lord. Guess what? You're right. You have no right. But God has called you. Amen. God has chosen you. Yes. He's chosen you to stand up to, the, the, to this Jezebel generation mm -hmm. that we face today. These battles that we are going to fight are with spiritual weapons, not earthly weapons. The weapon of prayer, the weapon of faith, and the weapon of serving the Lord by faith. He has placed these things upon you, church. 
God has chosen you. God has blessed you. God has called you. God has anointed you. God has put his name Jesus upon you. God has put his Holy Spirit on you to do the unthinkable, to do the impossible, to do what no other man in the flesh on this earth has the power to do, to honor God, to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is on trial. You hear me? The church of Jesus Christ is on trial, and Christian, you are on that stand. What will you say? What will you do? Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, give us wisdom. God, let us be found guilty of not wanting to stay in the cave of darkness, in the cave of the depression. The time is here. The time is now. Come out and testify to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the most awesome thing, the most awesome thing in this world is when a mere human being cries out to the creator of the universe, and he is heard. Amen. That's an awesome, the most awesome thing. When you cry out to the Lord and you're heard. The Bible says that, that the Lord is far away from the wicked, but he hears, he's attentive to the prayers of the righteous. And what is the righteous? Those who have placed their faith in Jesus. God looks at me and you, Christian, as righteous. Why? Because of Jesus. And when you have all of Jesus in you, the righteousness of God is upon you. But if you're compromising your faith, if you've got one foot in darkness and one foot in the light, and yes, you can do that. You know, you're like playing peekaboo with God. God don't play games. And neither does Satan. So the time is here, the time is now. Broke my heart to see these two New York City police officers just doing their job, sitting in their cruiser. The next thing you know, a man in his, not in his right mind, possessed by the devil, comes right up to the passenger side in a shooting stance and shoots both of them in the head, kills them instantly. New Yorkers are saying, I watched, they're saying, This is, what is this, Dodge City? This is not right. Yes, there's issues with police in the nation. But does this make it right? You're always going to have bad apples in a, in, a, in a profession. There's always bad apples in, in the profession of the clergy. There's always bad apples in the profession of football players. There's always some bad apples in the profession of the police department or the fire department or, you know, what, the presidency, you know, throughout the presidents. There's always been some bad apples. But does that make it right? Does that make it right? I'm telling you, 2015, if the Lord does not come and allows us all to live in this earth, 2015, and we said it in 2013, about 2014, we're going to be going into depths of darkness like never before, and we have. Let's look back on this very, very quickly. Look back on this. Now, people are, you know, heads being chopped off, put on video. It's becoming even common now. Oh, yeah, somebody got his head chopped off. It's on the internet now. People are saying, oh, we don't want to see that. So they ban the videos on the internet now, and you can't see those videos because they, th those type of people are like, well, let's just stick our head in the sand and act like it don't happen. It is happening. 2013, a man went in and killed a bunch of kindergartners. We're increasing, and 2015 is going to be a year when Israel, the foundations of this earth, are going to be shaken. And you're going to see a realignment of nations. You're going to see a realignment of leaders. The Arab Spring that happened a couple years back, where men who were empowered in, in Middle Eastern countries for years are all gone now. They've all been removed. And you sit there and you play your video games and, and you think, oh, well, you know, as long as I got the lights on and, and, we're, and the football game's playing and the sports are going, everything's going to be fine. No. But while we sit there in America, the world is changing and it's coming and it's actually here now. Right. Satan is very um, clever in how he does things. 
And we must be very mindful of how he does things. Church, if you're not, you know, young people, again, and my heart goes out to the young people, to this young generation. You know, my, 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 my kids, you know, that I look at them for, for the past 11 years, every morning I lay hands on them and I pray over them before they go on their way. Even now, every day I pray over them. They, they know not to leave the house until I pray over them. Because one day I may not be here. But anyone who sat under this ministry is going to know because they were told. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when, when, when you're going to either be faced to go into the cave or to stay out and to face the earthquake and the wind and the fire? Only to find out that all that was really going to be manifested to you and that mattered the most was that, that gentle voice of God. Father, we pray. And I thank you, Lord Jesus.